Now, you may recall a few weeks ago we reported on how apricot shares had taken a tumble following a story in the Sunday Times, which claimed that the company had only 3% of the business market. Well, this is an advanced copy of a report out next week. It's a detailed survey of microcomputer sales through dealers over the past three months. It shows Apricot has an 18.7% share of the British business market, roughly what the company claims. Probably the most significant trend is the march of IBM and IBM compatibles. Last quarter, it was estimated they had 58% of the British market, as against 45% in the first quarter. So it's clear from these up-to-the-minute figures that IBM is doing what observers have always predicted. It's slowly but inexorably taking over the PC market. Professor Martin Healy designed a personal computer in 1980 that he claims is a world beater. Fired with enthusiasm, he and a group of friends set up a factory in Silicon Glen in Scotland and called themselves Future Technology Systems. FTS produces several versions of its machines for different companies. Compared to their rivals, all are fast, have enormous memory and can run several programs at once. It's estimated that there will be a $350 billion market for business machines by 1990, and no machine as advanced as FTS's should get left on the shelf. But the day that we filmed at FTS, there was only one person assembling machines, and in August of 1985, FTS drastically cut their workforce. Why didn't this thoroughbred British machine find itself a slot on the world market? However British your computer may be, when it comes to selling it, you face one large problem. You'll find yourself in competition with a company that since 1980 has taken a third of the world market in personal computers. It dominates the business market and its market valuation is larger than any other company in the world. A staggering $80,000 million. It is of course... The monarch of Silicon Glen is IBM's 200 million pound plant outside Glasgow. From here, IBM, known as Big Blue to the computer professional, supplies Europe with personal computers. IBM didn't drop into the small computer market until 1980, although it's been making mainframes since 1946. But when it arrived, it used all of its selling skills to get the market taped. IBM introduced a basic machine, the PC, which sells for about £2,400. The XT, which has a much larger storage system, for £3,600 and the 80, which uses a very advanced microprocessor and sells for £4,100. It's important for IBM that the PC doesn't undermine sales of the display writer, IBM's antiquated but profitable word processor, and that the 80 doesn't compete with the desktop 36, which is a clever mini-computer capable of running several programs at once. The IBM PC works surprisingly slowly. It has a low-resolution screen, and it hasn't even got a shift lock on its keyboard. The AT has not yet been given a piece of IBM software that would allow it to run several programs at once like the desktop 36 can. Martin Healy claims that his machine can do everything that the PC, the XT, the display writer and the AT can do today for just £3,000. So why does IBM bother to have a product range? It's important that clearly you are developing your product line, you're improving the product line, and you're keeping pace with the needs of the end user. There's little point in going faster than the needs of the end user. But how has IBM captured a third of the market with such an uneasy collection of hardware on offer? It's because it dispels two major fears of the corporate buyer, 
The first is stability. Which computer company will still be around in 10 years' time? IBM. Uh, I'm not certain of anybody else, to be honest. The second is software. How many programs are there that run on the IBM machine? There are over 5,000 software packages available for the IBM PC. Everything from flight simulators to a pet cemetery management program. Every month, a hundred or more will appear, and just as likely, a hundred will equally disappear. The catch-22 for IBM's competitors is that the software writers write programs for the most popular micros. But to be the most popular micro means having the most software available. Our position at the time that we announced the PC back in the very early 80s was that we were keen to gain uh, fairly quick acceptance in the marketplace. We knew that whatever product we announced would only satisfy part of the, uh, the requirements of the mass of end users to whom we were trying to make our product attractive. And so we really needed to have third parties, uh, independent organizations that were producing equipment, be it hardware or software packages, that would enhance our product and make it attractive to a much wider audience. And the best way to do that, in our opinion, was to come out with an open architecture, and that's exactly what we did. Open architecture is an idea that used to be totally foreign to IBM's thinking. It means openly publishing all the specifications of the design of a computer, which IBM has done for the PC. Something that IBM's founder, Tom Watson, would never have dreamt of doing with his early mainframes. The EC in Brussels will be delighted if IBM disclosed information about their large machines as vigorously as they volunteered information about their personal computers. They were so concerned about the secrecy that still surrounds IBM's mainframes that in 1984 they made them sign an undertaking to give more information away to their competitors. But IBM's actions in allowing open access to the PC design is not as altruistic as you might think. It means that IBM can produce a bog-standard machine very cheaply, which other manufacturers can adapt to more specialist uses with their own circuit boards. This tactic has changed the microcomputer market beyond recognition, as rival manufacturers have copied IBM specifications in their own machines in order to run all the software written for the IBM PC. This has produced a host of computers which try to imitate the IBM range, known as compatibles. There are currently about 40 of them, and that means that 70% of the market now marches to IBM's tune. open architecture is extremely liberating but IBM haven't achieved an open architecture that they've offered a de facto standard uh, and it's a standard to an incredibly low level well I don't think it's a question of standards I think it's a question that we have chosen an architecture that we felt that we wanted to encourage companies to make investments within their product line uh, that was compatible with our equipment that would enhance our equipment that would add function and capability to our equipment and that's exactly what we did I mean that seems to me to be a sound commercial decision the paradox of FTS's position is that their machines are carefully checked for complete IBM compatibility before they leave the factory unless they adopt the standards Martin Healy so despises they cannot run IBM software the IBM PC's existence has created an awful lot of applications programs, very good ones, and we just simply want to be able to utilize those programs. We're not the slightest bit keen on rewriting a spreadsheet or a word processor. We just simply want to use the industry standard ones. But it's the way of running those applications programs that I'm objecting to, and the fact that they are totally hardware dependent. Uh, we're having to, for example, we have to reduce the resolution of our display systems in half just to match the low resolution of the IBM displays. If I can give you an analogy, it's a little like looking at the motor car industry, because if you talked about leading edge technology in the motor car industry, you'd be talking about Formula One racing cars. But the kind of car that you have down in your car park, that you buy the mass produced car, doesn't incorporate, at least at this point in time, some of the technologies which are available in the racing car. Martin Healy's problem is very simple. If he follows IBM standards too closely, he believes he compromises his own. But in following his own, he's so far ahead of the IBM compatible market that he's out in the technological wilderness. 
So slaving away in your workshop with a bright idea for a new computer won't automatically make you a fortune. A computer designer must think about the market and the way to squeeze into a gap in it and a gap that isn't already filled by Big Blue. Well, that's very difficult now because every manufacturer is trying to do the same thing and being presented with the same decisions when they come to design their own machine. First of all, they have to select a central processing unit, the engine of the computer. The most common micros use one of three processor manufacturers. Xilog, they make or they design the chips for the Sync uh, ZX80, 81 and the Spectrum, for the MSX range and also for Amstrad. Motorola make the chips, and that is a chip, from a Macintosh. They also make chips for the QL, the Sinclair QL, and the Commodore Amiga. And Intel make the chips for the Apricot, for the Olivetti M24, and of course the IBM PC range. But you need more than just an Intel processor to be IBM compatible. You have to run the same operating system. Let's have a look at what an operating system here is. Well, here's our computer. The operating system is a set of programs which run on the machine almost like a shell to enable applications like word processing, graphics, spreadsheet, database, payroll and so on to run. The operating system handles files on the disk and the internal organization of the machine. Generally speaking, a payroll program written under one operating system won't work on a different one. In the Motorola family, all these machines have different operating systems. So even though they use the same processor, they're all incompatible with each other, let alone with IBM. All these machines in the Intel family have the same Intel chip and Microsoft operating system in common. So you'd think there'd be no problem. Well, there is. This is an IBM PC. And here is a Taiwanese compatible for about a third the price. And there's the Olivetti M24 with much more power for about the same price as the PC. You can see how they're actually trying to compete with IBM in its marketplace. But how compatible are they really? Naively, you'd imagine you could take two programs running together on an IBM PC here and they'd run on the other two. Well, we've got one running here. It's running quite well on the IBM PC. On this machine, the Taiwanese machine, immediately we hit fatal error, error 70, insert disk with slash command, etc. on the first screen. With the Olivetti, we didn't even get that far. We hit sector not found, error reading, drive B, abort, retry, ignore. 